sure do love you all. So, welcome to Tune In Tuesday, Session 5B of the One Baptism of Original Christianity, The Builders of Redemption Road. We've been building towards the inauguration of Christianity on the day of Pentecost when the church started. Now, I ended Session 4 with another cliffhanger. <laughs> What concerning salvation came on Pentecost that was unexpected? Well, we're still developing toward that big reveal, and we're almost there. But we must still realize that during the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus the Messiah, the great mystery was still a secret. Their disciples were actually expecting something quite different than what actually came on the day of Pentecost. They were expecting the kingdom of heaven to come to pass. They were looking at the wrong blueprint for Redemption Road. God, in his foreknowledge, had some secret revisions of the plan, but the believers didn't know about that yet. To them, the prophecy in Daniel of the image with the head of gold and the feet of mixed iron and clay pointed to their time frame for the arrival of the Messiah. Even just before the ascension, they were still asking Jesus about the kingdom. Before that, the mother of two of the apostles asked him to grant that they would be sitting on either side of him in his kingdom. The people at one point mounted a draft Jesus king attempt. Even Judas had tried to be the finger of God to precipitate a confrontation between Jesus and the high priest, trying to corner Jesus and expecting him to come out fighting with all his heavenly resources. But instead of power brokering with the well-do, Jesus was eating with publicans and sinners. Instead of demonizing opponents and manipulating the people to back him thereby, he was preaching love. Love your enemies. Jesus Jesus, what were you thinking? <laughs> Another factor that we must take into account in this analysis is that there are some things in Christianity that we are so used to today that we read them back into those times thinking that they all knew about them, that they were coming, when actually the believers had no idea. For example, us calling God a father is commonplace today, but Back then, when Jesus did so, it was revolutionary. Back then, God's plan to build Redemption Road was still in process, still on track to redeem us and the world, which had been forfeited by Adam into the control of the adversary. The central promise concerning this was in Genesis 3.15. Please take a look at Genesis 3.15. Here it says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This verse is full, chock full, of all kinds of great information. First of all, I will put enmity. Enmity. Yeah. Yeah great rancor, the most extreme hostility imaginable, with the greatest stakes possible. The winner would shape eternity. This was the greatest dire clash of titans of all time. God and his angels and his arch enemy, the devil and his angels, battling behind the scenes in massive, tumultuous warfare, continuously raging invisibly beyond the pale of the physical realm the natural man caught in between invisibly but in reality reeling from their unseen forces the earthly main actors of this conflict were the seed of the devil and those building toward the coming seed of the woman so i will put enmity between thee the adversary and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and satan said oh oh I can have seed? Woo! Well, I'll get right on that. Cain was the first one. Ever since then, they have plotted behind the scenes, working their wily wall, maneuvering their unsuspecting surrogates into harm's way. 
Then there is the seed of the woman. That mighty and intelligent and beautiful Eve had been tricked by the adversary, but one day, in an ironic turnabout, a serendipitous, how about that, poetic justice moment, a woman would be given seed to give birth to the Redeemer, and after that, regain her status. Woohoo! Then, bruise his head and bruise his heel. The adversary's head would be bruised, utterly crushed. What rulership was that? His headship. Well, his freshly ill-gotten rulership of the world. That would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And the adversary would bruise his heel. The adversary's enemy, the seed of the woman, would be utterly crushed, apparently. And that was bruising his heel, his usurpation against the adversary's rulership. Well, the reverberations of this promise would shake history. We, looking back at this, can see it clearly. But those in the Old Testament who contemplated its implications, they saw through a glass darkly. Wow, what a truth for God to pronounce before the paint had even dried on the adversary's new coat of arms. Bit by bit, more and more of that future redemption was revealed. First of the faithful pre flood prophets who saw our future redemption emblazoned across the sky, foretold in the constellations of the Zodiac. Next, to Noah and Shem, who proclaimed God's name to the new world. Then, to Abraham, and consequently, after it was revealed, the Messiah would come through his progeny, the fury of the adversary was focused upon them. And so the events of the Old Testament transpired more and more, and more of the prophecy picture was being filled in. But we must realize they could not see what we see. For now, much of the final blueprint remained hidden in the great mystery. So, was our age of grace anticipated? Not hardly. There were glimmers, but they could easily be attributed to other things. Was remission and forgiveness anticipated? Yes, it was, but Isaiah 53 was an enigma. The Messiah? Suffering? How would the Messiah suffer? Was there a time period between the suffering and his glory? No one knew for sure. Was the Spirit being given anticipated? Yes, but they did not expect it till the resurrection. Was righteousness and justification anticipated? Yes, but not until the restitution of all things. These all were thought to happen in the millennial kingdom. So the gospel period was a time of great speculation and anticipation. What on earth was happening? The faithful gasped at the great miracles occurring in the rapid succession, one after another, in Jesus' ministry. It was like a roller coaster to glory. These certainly were momentous times. But what did they mean? And what was coming next? To properly frame this, I must take you back to the turning point of all time, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And the known world had stopped to take a breath. The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was in full swing. Begun with the rule of Emperor Augustus in 27 BC, it was a time of unprecedented peace and prosperity in the Roman Empire. Instead of focusing upon relentlessly expanding its borders, the Roman engine turned upon improving itself. Frontiers were secured. Roads, harbors, and cities were built. There were gains in the arts, discoveries in science and medicine, inventions in technology, milestones in mathematics. If you were a Roman citizen, the world was your oyster. Society was in a time of change, looking forward to better and better things. The world was ripe for transformation, and into this milieu was born the Messiah. But Judaism, on the other hand, was groaning for respite from both the Roman political oppression and Pharisaic religious abuse. The Pharisees and Sadducees were in firm control of Judaism. Like orthodoxy today, compared with original Christianity, Pharisaic Judaism was a gross caricature of Mosaic Judaism. 
It was in a sorry state and in great need of reform. The precepts of men were being taught as commandments of God. Legalism was rampant. You see, the nature of evil is such that when it prevails, it only gets worse until it turns on itself and burns itself out. And that cycle was in full swing. But don't take my word for it. We even have contemporary evidence from the Bible itself in the prayers of Simeon and Anna when Jesus was brought to Jerusalem. Go to Luke. This was when he was a baby, and they reflect the sorry state of Judaism at that time. In Luke 2, Luke chapter 2, Luke 2.25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he, this is Simeon, up in his arms, took up the baby Jesus, and blessed God, and said, Lord, now lettest thou my sir, thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Well, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Okay? Well, why does it say that? Because at that time, Israel was inconsolable. This, this consolation, this, this comment was very significant. Because God's people ached under the dual thumbs of the Roman political domination and the legalistic religious domination of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But... Yet, there were still believers who were just and devout, who could see that change was needed. This passage said that Simeon had the Spirit upon him, so God was still at work, even in the darkness of circumstances. Then Luke continues on to say, Luke chapter 2, verse 36, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about 84 years, departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in at that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. See, here's another clue as to the state of mind of many of the believers. There were people at that time who were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. Why? Because it was in dire need of it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had crept in and taken control. The truth contained in the scriptures had been glossed over by the religion of men. And there had not been a major prophet in Palestine since Malachi. They'd killed the rest of the prophets God sent. The sage had supplanted the prophet. When the wrong people get in charge of a religious organization, or once right leaders go awry, things can become very difficult for the congregation. Now, of course, I understand that this opinion about the state of the Pharisees is in opposition to the softened stance of some modern scholars toward the Pharisees. But they've compromised a lot else, even questioning the authenticity of the Bible. This, A clear example of this is how Stephen Wiley tries to explain it away in his book, The Jews in the Time of Jesus, an Introduction. He says, The charge that the Pharisees were hypocritical and legalistic has been convincingly disproved by Christian and Jewish scholars. It has. Well, the, the charge of superficiality and legalism contrasted to Jesus' inwardness and spirituality reflects the prejudices of the 19th century scholars of the German Enlightenment. 
They attributed to Jesus their own view of the essence of religion. They took the Enlightenment view that true religion is a matter of individual conscience unrelated to material social concerns. They relegated to the Jewish Pharisees everything they hated about religion, unquote. Well, the Bible and I strongly disagree. The Pharisees definitely were hypocritical and legalistic and superficial. Now, of course, I'm not advocating the hatred of anyone or anything. You know, we want to help people. But what are we supposed to do? Pick and choose which of the sayings of Jesus we like and then attribute the rest that we don't like to the opinions that were injected by supposed second century gospel writers? No. Matthew and John were eyewitnesses and they were among the apostles. They wrote their gospels that bear their name. And Luke and Mark were travelers with Paul and they wrote their gospels. The synoptic gospels were written about the middle third of the first century and the gospel of John shortly thereafter. So with Jesus' teachings, it, it should be either all or nothing. We can't pick and choose from his sayings. Now, Jesus did utter some wonderful, um, uplifting things that everyone can agree with, but he also was in a dire spiritual conflict, like I talked about that enmity earlier, and sometimes had to declare things that were very direct and challenging. But, you know, he didn't preach hatred, but he firmly reproved when reproof was necessary and I'm taking my views of the Pharisees and Sadducees directly from what Jesus declared about them. He called them hypocrites. He declared woe to them. Well, they murdered the prophets. You can't soften that. Pharisaic Judaism was so religiously hardened that it would take a spiritual jackhammer to crack it open. And that jackhammer was John the Baptist who was equipped with the Spirit upon him from before his birth. John the Baptist had great influence, but there's only a few verses which describe his ministry. So tonight, I'm going to mine those verses for the gems which will portray John the Baptist's real impact. This is what Gabriel told John's father when he had a, that vision in the temple in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 verse 13 says but the angel said to him fear not Zechariah for thy prayer is heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son and you shall call his name John that's from the Hebrew word Yohanan which means gracious and thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from, and the word is ek, from his mother's womb. Now, verse 15 contains three phrases which foretold the character of his life's ministry. He was, quote, great in the sight of the Lord, unquote, in the sight of the Lord. He lived his entire life like he knew God was watching and, quote, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, unquote. That implies great piety. Someone who took a vow of a Nazarite abstained from the pleasures of the sentences. The phrase, quote, from his mother's womb, unquote, uses the preposition ek, out from, which implies origin, instead of apa, the Greek word which means from the surface of. So if it were a paw, it would be from birth, but it's ek. So this declares that he had the spirit upon him from conception. Wow. But that's also why John as a fetus leapt in his mother's womb. Now for first pregnancies, women don't feel fetal movement till about 25 weeks. And so Elizabeth at six months pregnant was right on schedule. But the synchronized timing of it with Mary's arrival shows that the Spirit was upon John before he was born. He was ingrained with it. That is why later he could reprove people's thoughts before they expressed them. Imagine that in use 
in a ministry of repentance and reform. Whoa, how confronting. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 16. Part of the prophecy continues. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That spirit and power of Elijah in our one spirit class, we covered that's a handiades. That's where two things are stated as one. The powerful spirit of Elijah. Elijah was regarded as one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. He ministered under great oppression in the northern kingdom, which at that time was ruled by the amoral Ahab and the evil Jezebel. So he ministered under extremely negative circumstances, yet single-handedly turned things around. He killed all of Jezebel's prophets, and he foretold and he believed for it to not reign for three and a half years, and he brought fire from heaven. He even prophesied Jezebel's demise. And in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the last verses in the Old Testament, they say, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Whoa, <laughs> that's the last thing in the Old Testament. <laughs> what an exclamation mark. Turn in the Luke account is the word epistrepho. In biblical times, servants were to always have their eyes on their master. The movies are inaccurate when they portray the master clapping to get servants' attention. No, not in biblical servants. Their servants had their eyes upon their masters, and the master would just make a slight, silent movement to signal to them. Just like a good waiter or a waitress will observe their tables and bring more coffee or water, etc., when it's needed, or they'll return soon, but not too soon, after the food is brought to see if any they need any condiments, etc. Of course, if they want a nice tip, they're not supposed to go to their station and obviously not look at their tables. <laughs> and their customers have to neglect their food and stare at them until they see they're looking and then signal. <laughs> we all served other things, including ourselves, before we made Christ our Lord. We had our gaze on those things. So to turn, as in turn away from that, was an act of changing masters. We have a new Lord. Accordingly, to turn has a metaphorical meaning of to reform oneself. So, turn the hearts of fathers to the children. This is a coming back to innocence, a back to genuineness, back to simple faith. Jesus emphasized having childlike faith and, quote, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. This implies an entire process of reproof, which often involves bold truth speaking, overcoming blindnesses and deafnesses, and correction, which involves inculcating right habits, and, of course, doctrine, which is instruction and righteousness. The goal is restoration and includes the mental and physical healing as a result. Then, quote, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It's a people. A people. John's effect would be so great, it would cause societal change. One man, John the Baptist, started it and Jesus continued it to fruition. In volleyball terms, <laughs> John set it up so Jesus could spike it. Many great world movements have started with one individual. John was the right man with the right message at the right moment, and he fulfilled his destiny. But 
As James declares, this kind of preparation must also entail the shedding of evil. For in James one twenty one, if we want to receive with meekness the engrafted word, we first have to wherefore lay apart all filthiness and abundance of wickedness. Then we can receive with meekness the engrafted word, and that's able to save our souls. So, John's ministry was a ministry of repentance. Now, this includes confrontation, encouragement, confession of sin, excising evil, and a changing of ways. He was to do this to prepare a people. The word prepare is kata skuadzo. Now, skua means attire in Greek. It is special clothing suited for a special purpose, such as the clothing and equipment needed by a soldier or a priest or a specialized worker. It entailed special equipment. Now, with the kata prefix, that expresses a thoroughness all along a vector. One use was to prepare thoroughly for war. That involves a host of things. People were going to be prepared to be at the Lord's service, and it would be a thorough preparation. That's what he was to do. First, cleaning them up and turning them away from the vices of the times, both physical and mental, philosophical and religious, and setting them back firmly in original Judaism. This is similar to what I'm attempting with the teaching of these seven ones of original Christianity. Our society is as wayward as theirs was, but we are a generation of true seekers too, as they were in the Pax Romana. John was preparing them, completely clothing them with the special attires needed to be leaders and followers teachers and students, fighters and peacemakers, deep thinkers and craftsmen, champions of judgment and mercy, all, all the diverse supporting cast for a ministry which was to change the world forever, a people, a mighty assembly, fully outfitted to serve the Lord, one man, John the Baptist, a man with spirit upon him from birth, did that. No wonder Apollos, 350 miles away, in Alexandria of Egypt, 27 years later, as it talks about in the book of Acts, he was still affected by John the Baptist. Here's what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Look, take a look at Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departed... He began to speak unto them, unto the people concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? What went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out to for to see? A prophet, yea, I say to you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, because the spiritual blessings that we all get will be greater. And all the people that heard him And the publicans justify God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, the teachers of the law, rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation in the Jews? And to what are they like? Verse 32. They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another, and saying, We have piped unto you, and you have not danced. And we have mourned to you, and you have not wept. You know what that means? There was no 
proper response to either extreme joy or sorrow. That's like A to Z. It's a figure of speech which implies they had an improper response to all stimuli in their society. They were desensitized to life and truth. Wow. John the Baptist came to crack that open. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking water, and you said he had a devil. But the Son of Man is coming eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. So Jesus illustrated their inconsistency, their situation ethics, their willingness to say anything that would be to their benefit, just like politicians today. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, But wisdom is justified of all her children. In other words, <laughs> what we would say is, Well, consider the source. <laughs> In this light, the prophecy of Zechariah, his father, is very illuminating. When John the Baptist was born, Luke chapter 1, verse 67, Luke chapter 1, verse 67, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now, this was actually spoken six months before Jesus was even born. Yet, it was couched in the past tense, the aorist tense. Here the word visit means visit with a goal to help, aiding, all right? Now, we know from other classes that in the prophetic glossary, a horn is a king. He talked about a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David. And then in the next few verses, he lists the conditions that were being endured at that time. Luke chapter 1, verse 70. And he, that's as God, as God spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should, or shall actually, be saved from our enemies and out from the hand of all that hate us. So this is referring to the Roman dominion. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swear to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Well, they were under a whole lot of fear at that time. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. In this prophecy, it was talking about the ills of their government and the society at that time, which were an impediment to their walking in holiness and righteousness. Also in here, where it refers to mercy, the greatest form of mercy is salvation and that they would be without fear well they were living in fear both of the romans and the fear motivating legalistically spiritually abusive pharisees and then he says to the infant and thou verse 70, verse 76 and thou child shalt be called the prophet of the highest for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, just like we talked about before, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Well, this stuff is Jeremiah 31 stuff. That prophecy was electric. It goes on, verse 78, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring the sunrise from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Wow, that generation indeed was sitting in darkness in the shadow of death. And as Melvin taught us, he was a light to them. There are more verses about the impact of John the Baptist. Take a look at Matthew chapter 3. We're getting to know John the Baptist and what he was like. 
Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. And in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his paths straight. The wilderness is another term in the heavenly glossary. It represents the world where the adversary has had his way. We would say, it's a jungle out there. They would say, it's a wilderness out there. The paths that people were supposed to walk were crooked and twisted because of man's error. John the Baptist was to teach genuine Judaism and straighten them out. Verse 4, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle around his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. <laughs> locusts. Now, I, I once taught that these were pods from a tree, but now they actually are the other kind of locusts. The bugs, ooh, it was, it was kosher to eat them, either raw or roasted. Ooh. And then wild honey. Uh, this implies that others did the work to provide things for his survival. Now, of course, those were not the only things he ate. This was a expression indicating that he lived out in the desert, in the wilderness, living off the land. <laughs> he was Jeremiah Johnson of Judea. <laughs> he was living away from the evil influ influences of society until the time for him to explode upon the scene. Uh, and he was even dressed like Elijah the prophet, compared with Second Kings chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, with the leather girdle. Verse 5, And then he went out, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and the region around about Jordan, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, the confession of sin, that's a sign of repentance and reform. See, John the Baptist was a leader of a reform movement. Now think about that. Think about modern examples of reform movements. What kind of people do they attract? They attract genuine people who care. Dedicated people, moral folks, who are willing to get involved and make a change for the better. Better. So those were the kind of people in John's reform movement that were attracted those kind of people are brave. They're willing to take flack for their beliefs. So those were the kind of people who then came to Jesus when John was arrested and executed. John's movement resonated in Jewish culture because the people knew stuff was wrong. The Pharisees and Sadducees had warped Judaism. Just like Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool all of the people some of the time and you can fool some of the people all of the time but you can't fool all the people all of the time. They knew stuff was wrong. Anyone could tell things were off. But the Pharisees and Sadducees used intimidating tactics to get their way and many were afraid to oppose them but not these guys who went to John the Baptist they were reformers, and not John the Baptist either. He was courageously in the Pharisees' face, telling them like it was. Verse 7, But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God's able even of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now look at that. Think not. God revealed their thoughts to John. Now, can you imagine how confronting that would be if somebody reproved you, your thoughts, before you even voice them? Wow! His ministry, obviously, was 
spirit propelled, Holy Spirit propelled. God told him their thoughts. Imagine this. It'd be like walking down the busy sidewalk and then stopping to ask someone, would you like to be delivered from your obsession with pornography? Boom! Bullseye! Or somebody else, would you like to be cured of your substance abuse problem? Bang! Or somebody else, would you like respite from your bitterness of soul? Boom! Would you like to understand your purpose in this life? Sharp shot. He was like that. Verse 10. And then, now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings forth not fruit, good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. A tree is a growth system. It grows with the goal of producing fruit, which has seed in it, which produces more life, and that goes on and on. So a tree is a perpetual motion growth cycle. And the Pharisee's tree was corrupt. It would soon be hewn down. The axe was at its root. Their ilk would not be going to seed anymore because within a generation, the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem scattered. And after that, after they picked up the pieces, Judaism would not be the same. It goes on to say, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor like threshing floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, this was a ministry of repentance. Now, repentance, that's not merely a pain of mind <laughs> because we were caught in the wrong. It is a change of mind for the better. That better is something moral. It means to reform, to have a genuine change of heart. Mark chapter 1. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Verse 1. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger, that's angelos, before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance. For the remission of sins, that was the focus of his ministry. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, chronologically, this was February. That water was cold! woo -hoo! And John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So, verse chapter 3, verse 1. Luke chapter 3. And in verse 1, it says, Now in the fifteenth year... Of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod the Tetrarch being of Galilee, and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iduria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanus the Tetrarch of Abilene. Verse 2 Annas and Caiaphas, two priests, are only supposed to have one, but at this time Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, Luke chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 is very important to date the beginning of John's ministry and therefore Christ's ministry. Um, I'm going to um, give you some supplemental information from Walter Cummins' book, 
the acceptable year of the Lord in which he charts out these different dates, how they fit. And um, now the Jews told time differently than we. They counted differently than we do. Um, I learned that from Edwin Thiel, T-H-I-E-L-E, in his book, The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings. In order to figure out how the Judeans told time, I actually had to get graph paper and count the squares because it's different than what we think. And to precise, to be precise, I had to count the squares. But anyway, verse 3, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Then it goes on to say, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John the Baptist was like a heavy earth mover, mowing down mountains and filling valleys. Well, that is what was needed to build Redemption Road, right over the valleys and straight through the mountains. Valleys represent need. Mountains represent a dominating position looming over people. The mountains can be either good or bad, because like Psalm 18, God makes our feet like hinds feet and sets us upon our high places. But in this case, The mountains represented the adversary's dominant position in that culture. This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40. So the Pharisees had made the roads crooked. They'd torn up God's blueprint and built detours. The adversary had carved valleys and obstructed the way with mountains. But God's God, the architect, energized John the Baptist the construction foreman to bulldoze right straight through them. That path was straight through the desert to bridge the chasm between man and God. Redemption Road was the path into eternity. Luke chapter 3 verse 7, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God is able even of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. But now is the axe laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that brings forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. See, like all great preachers, by his sheer light illuminating their darkness, John the Baptist brought people to a point of decision. Light or darkness? What do you want? Verse 10, and the people asked him, saying, what shall we do? And he answered and said to them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then also came the publicans to be baptized and said to him, Master, what shall we do? And he said to them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So he brought even them to a point of decision. He even got to the publicans and the soldiers. The publicans specifically were the despised tax collectors. But this term also was put for Jews who were Roman sympathizers. These were greatly loathed by the people. But John even reached them. He was so effective, he even motivated the Roman soldiers. Verse 15, And and as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, he, he answered their thoughts, saying to them, 
all. I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes, the latch of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his foreign and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. See, many other things. He was preparing them. He just didn't preach one thing. He was preparing the people meet for their master's use. That entailed preaching and exhorting many things, healing and strengthening in all categories. Redemption Road was to be a superhighway with all the amenities, all the details covered. And then John introduced he who would function as the bridge. Verse 15, John chapter 1, verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke, that after cometh, cometh after me is preferred before me, before he was, because he was foremost. And of his fullness have I have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, Well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, No, I'm not Elijah. Are you that prophet? He said, No. Then said he unto him, Who are you? that we may give an answer of them that sent us. What do you say of yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked and said to him, Why do you baptize then, if you aren't the Christ, nor Elijah, neither they, that prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you who you don't know. He it is who coming after me is prefer, preferred in front of me, whose shoe latch I'm not worthy to unloose. You see, these were the two builders of Redemption Road. John the Baptist, the construction foreman, and Jesus Christ, the redemption bridge. And this road still exists today. Hear ye, hear ye. Why tarry ye in darkness? There's a pathway upon which the light grows brighter every day. A highway of holiness with no beast thereon, stretching straight through the wilderness to the heart of God. Come ye, come ye to Redemption Road. Your burdens can be light. Your blessings can be great. And the toll over the bridge to freedom has been paid. Two of God's men built this road, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. The major theme of John's ministry was repentance. There are two words that are translated, repent. What is that? What's repentance? Well, it's more than feeling sorry. One word is meta noeo. This means a genuine change of heart, a change of one's mind with a better moral outcome. Then there's metamelomai. That means, sorry you were caught. <laughs> or pain of mind. Or dissatisfaction with one's self. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter 7. Because it uses both of those words. Second Corinthians chapter 7, beginning with verse 8. Second Corinthians 7, 8. Paul says, For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, metamelomai, I don't regret it. Though I did repent, melomai, I did feel bad. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, metanoeo. That's the change of heart. See, he wrote 1 Corinthians and reproved the Corinthians for all kinds of stuff. All right, that's what this is talking about. 
he rejoices not that he made they he made them sorry, but that they sorrowed to meta noeo repentance, a change, a genuine change of heart. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us and nothing. Verse ten. For godly sorrow works repentance, meta noel, to salvation, to wholeness. That's spiritual, mental, and physical wholeness. Not to be repented of. That's ah metamelomai. Now ah in, in Greek is a prefix like un. So ah metamelomai means to be not regretted of. But the sorrow of the world works death. Verse 11, For behold, this self same thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. And then it talks about the process of genuine repentance. What carefulness it wrought. The word wrought is kata ergazomai. Kata is going through an entire, from A to Z, through a process. So, Ergazomai is, is a working. It's a working through an entire process to achieve a goal. So what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Well, you know, if you make mistakes, we're supposed to pick ourselves back up. We're supposed to ask for forgiveness, supposed to make corrections, and redouble our efforts to make sure we were right. That's what this is talking about. This is what repentance really is. You see, there's two roads after finding out we're wrong. All right? People can condemn themselves and beat themselves up. That's the you caught me kind of repentance. It's a dissatisfaction with oneself. <laughs> and we end up doing a better job of it than the adversary ever could. We end up doing his work for him. That's the sorrow of the world. And you know what? It can go on for years. Well, when, when will it stop? I mean, are the effects of evil supposed to last forever? They do last longer if we carry the adversary's water for him in the various ways he's tricked us into doing so. Well, can light overcome darkness? Can good overcome evil? But that process needs our participation, and you can do it. You can climb out of any funk step by step, bit by bit, you know, that's how the weight loss programs work. It's not overnight, but bit by bit. And they address our habits that got us where we were. <laughs> well, if that works for fat, couldn't it work for grief or sorrow or defeat or inadequacy or rage or weakness or, or whatever load we've convinced ourselves that we have to carry? Because, you know, it is just mental energy. And because of that, we can sublimate that energy and redirect it and use that energy to propel us towards our goal, wholeness. That is the process, kata ergazomai. That is the sorrow unto repentance. Sure, reproof stings sometimes. Yes, that's the sorrow. We're, we're sorry we screwed up. But you take that energy and apply it. Instead of tearing yourself apart, you use that same energy to build yourself up. We decide how to use it. It's just as easy to go down either road. But because of Satan's influences in the world we live in, many are more used to go down that other road downward. But if we practice going the other way, it's just like surfing waves. After some practice, you get the knack. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11 is the process, caught ergazomai, of repentance to salvation, to wholeness, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world works death. For behold, verse 11, this self-same thing, 
You sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness. That's the word spude. Diligence. It worked, caught ergazomai in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. That is defense. That's an answer of defense in the face of accusation. What indignation. That means, it, you know, we're peeved <laughs> that we were tricked. <laughs> what fear, what reverence, all right? And then, what vehement desire. That's a longing for the benefits of being back in fellowship. Yea, what zeal. That's how you get it done. And what revenge. And all things we've approved or shown or commended ourselves to be clear, pure, pure in the light of day in this matter. This is a process of repentance that works. If we follow this process, we can make the adversary sorry he ever messed with us. Just be diligent. Spude. Get it on. We make our defense by claiming our forgiveness in Christ and putting on the righteousness he bought for us. And we just don't take his forgiveness and run. <laughs> uh, we're, we're indignant we got tricked and we vow to do better. Then we go through the other steps of walking in greater reverence of God and cognizance of his presence. See, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If we apply that to this circumstance, you know, our motivation to improve after making mistakes is not fear. It's based on love. We revere God so much for all the things he's done for us we don't want to let him down that's the right motivation right and so <laughs> we long for our relationship with the rest of fellowship and the believers to be set right we zealously serve and a great way is to get right back up and do your ministry if you don't know what your ministry is just get busy you know ultimately you'll find out and Ultimately, that is how we take our revenge upon the adversary by shining our light that he tried to put out. That's genuine revenge. That revenge is living right, living like the bad never happened, not letting anything derail us from our calling, just getting healed takes time, but like Job, at the end, we collect our godly insurance policy payment that pays double. All right? These are things we can do and teach others because they work. They're simple. Just put one foot in front of the other, walk step by step down Redemption Road because we have a message of deliverance. We can help people. Hear ye, hear ye. Cast forth your nets, you fishers of men. Rescue those who are to be redeemed. Teach them the steps, these steps of genuine repentance. The church today largely has it backward. Genuine motivation to encourage repentance involves positive energy. It requires a self-motivation to do better in order to please God because we love him and don't want to let him down for all he did for us. It does not involve negative energy, a pressure from without, fear, motivation, and dread of hellfire. It's not a preacher skillfully utilizing psychological techniques to condemn people with a smile on his face. <laughs> Romans chapter 2 talks about this. We'll end up here. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest does the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, according to them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them who do such things, and does the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? 
or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance, not fear. This is the motivation that beckons us to get on Redemption Road. The signature trait of John's ministry was redemption and water baptism. What was the water baptism all about? Well, Mel's covered the symbolic significance of water in the mikvah for cleansing, but I didn't really understand the practice of water baptism until I was studying about proselytes. I read about it in the Bible dictionary that Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism had to do three things. They had to be circumcised, they had to be water baptized, and they had to be catechized, catechism, instructed in Judaism. And then it dawned on me why water baptism had become so popular to them at that time. The faith had become so polluted that John the Baptist boldly told them, though those Jewish believers of that time, that they needed to start all over again, like proselytes. Pharisaic Judaism was that corrupt. It was as deviant from the original as Orthodox Christianity today is from original Christianity. He was already instructing them, and they couldn't be recircumcised, all right? But they could be baptized. And that is why I believe water baptism resonated within the Jewish revival movement as a refreshing rite of recommitment to turn away from the darkness and turn away from the error. Today, the same invitation is offered in a world that is just as misdirected as they. There are lots of roads, but none is like Redemption Road. It was built for us by John and Jesus. So come, take a stroll with us. Onward ho! Bless you.